Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Aerobilities HQ. And uh, joining me today are two of my colleagues and very good friends, Clive and Harvey. And uh, we're in the boardroom of the charity at the moment, um, which is where normally all the big meetings are held. But really, today, the idea behind today is just three guys well, with different dis disabilities sitting around a table and just, just having a chat about the issues that are really, really important to us and, um, and what makes our life so, so good through work, through flying with Aerobility. So I'll just tell you a little bit about myself to begin with, and maybe then we can just introduce ourselves to everybody out there. So I'm Neil Tucker. I'm a trustee with uh, Aerobility. Uh, I'm also a flyer with the charity as well. Um, and I was involved in a pretty catastrophic motorcycle accident in 2014, uh, which saw me losing my left leg and the use of my left arm. And it was because of the Aerobility charity that I was able to, uh, to sort of put myself forward and get, get flying, which was a wonderful liberating experience, I'm sure Clive. You've got similar stories as well. I have, yeah. My name's Guy Jones. I've uh, been flying with Aerobility for a couple of years. Um, I've always been interested in flying, though. I learnt, um, I learned to fly with the Air Cadets a little bit when I was in the Air Cadets when I was a teenager. Always fancied being a pilot. Um, but when I was 17, I had a really catastrophic motorcycle accident and uh, managed to break my neck. And um, I was paralysed from the chest down when it first happened, lost movement in all my, in my hands, most of the movement in my arms and everything below the chest. Um, spent nine months in hospital and came out using a wheelchair and then after a couple of years I've been on crutches and I've been on crutches ever since. These motorbikes are quite dangerous things aren't they? Really? They are quite dangerous, So yes. we, we give up motorbikes because that would lead to divorce <laughs> and now we're going to go into aerobatics which is just brilliant yes. isn't it? I feel very inadequate <laughs> because I'm the only one without a disability story. You've got a very good disability story, yeah, you know it? that. But it's not as dramatic as ours. No, I'm dramatic. <laughs> so Harvey, tell us about yourself. So I'm Harvey Matthewson, I'm the Aviation Activities Officer at Aerobility. Been flying here since 2016. Uh, came here to get over a baby of flying, and I have achieved that. I've uh, now got my PPL, and uh, looking forward to becoming an instructor one day when I grow up. When you grow up, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I grow up, I want to be a pilot. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, but you've had a lifelong story, Harvey, of disability, and it's it's slightly different to Clive and I, who were once upon a time, even though it was many years ago for Clive and a few for me. You you've been disabled since birth, so yeah. obviously you've had to put up with a lot more than than we've experienced over, over that that life story. Yeah. So, I guess the first question that, that 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 hits me is everyone's different, but what what's air ability done for us? And what's it it's done for you, Clive? What does it mean to you? Uh, it's given me a new hobby, definitely, and it's given me definitely a goal um, and something to aim for. I um, needed a, something new, a new challenge in my life and um, a couple of years ago I thought, I don't know, I did a bit of googling, a bit of research and I thought it's, there must be uh, a way for me to learn to fly and I flamed aerobility and I've um, not looked back really. It's in Kerbox, I did exactly the same thing for me, it was Google. It was laying in a hospital bed, mm -hmm. and I wonder if I can, and, and, and you take it from there. That's so it's thank God for the internet, isn't it? Mm. What about you, Harves? I um, came here for a flying day when I was a, a bit younger, uh, probably about 14, and uh, refused to fly. Um, no one could convince me. Uh, but I always had that interest in aviation. And a few years later, I went off to Africa um, and they, they asked me how I was going to continue my development once I got home. And I said, well, my biggest fear worth fighting is, is flying. So I'm going to um, become a pilot when I get home. And I sort of went, oh, OK. A couple of years passed. And uh, I was at college, and uh, I don't story around flying. It starts from trying to impress a girl, and <laughs> and I thought that the best way to impress her was to sort of fulfil the promise I had made 
two years previous and so he got in touch for variability and the, the rest is history. So uh, it's, it's cured you of your, your phobia of flying, but what was your phobia? Was it a height phobia? Was it a crashing phobia? Was it a, what was the phobia? I guess crashing. Um, it's that, unhealthy, it's yeah. unhealthy, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like an unpleasant experience, but just everything about it. So when I was young, I think I had quite a bad experience where I wasn't expecting the takeoff and got thrown back in my seat, and then I think there on in it was quite a bumpy flight and mm. I think it all sort of stems from that. But because of my interest in flying, as a young person I was an avid viewer of air crash investigation. Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> and I didn't think that that helped either. But it was so bad that at its worst I had to take tablets just wow. to get on the plane to go on the holiday. My, my wife says to me, when we're talking about air, cra air, cra air crash investigations, she says, what the hell are you watching this for? <laughs> so now it's important to learn all these things, but, but it's interesting you saying about how, how your phobia was quite strong and you managed to overcome that and that. Yeah. So air ability has, has changed that. Because I know that you have, you've obviously had a lifelong love of aviation, haven't you? Yeah. Cause, and you still simulate, simulate, simulate. That's your thing, isn't it? Yes, is it? I, I don't want to talk about that. That's his soft spot. That's his soft underbelly. Yeah. Simulate. And, and I guess... Well, that's me single for the rest of the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks, Neil. Throw me under the desk again. I, 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 talking about your fear, it's quite... I can sort of relate to that in that I've never had a fear of flying. I've always felt at home up there, you know, like it was just meant to be. But you, you can't go through um, a life-changing event like I went through late in life without becoming very aware of your own mortality, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, to the point of, you know, even when I was being sent solo by Mike, I jumped out of the plane because we were refueling. He jumped out, I turned the engine off, and I went to do a, a pre-flight check again. And he said, look, can you just get in the in the plane and go and fly a solo? But I wanted to check and it was, it was absolutely bang on. So, yeah, I think everyone's got their own, I think, healthy peccadillos is, 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 is yeah, the key yeah. thing there. I think, interestingly, when you get your licence, you sort of become nervous about flying again but because you know what's going on so it's no longer a fear but you've got that awareness of, it is but i think yeah. i was i was flying with mike's carer the other day uh with dale who's a lovely chap to fly with. he's so enthusiastic and he asked me he said do you, do you get scared flying and i said well no not really because I trust in the training and that's the yeah. key thing yeah. um, and just going back to the solo event when you go solo you you put out into the runway and you think God, don't do it now this has really got to be spot on but as soon as you do that that's it that's yeah. it and you're just off and, off and running so yeah. yeah I get that phobia but I, it, it, for me it's, it certainly has changed my life there, there but as you think we took me from a very very dark corner into something very very positive and warm and it's more than just the flying I, I don't think capability is about the flying whatsoever, uh, to be fair. I think what I've gained from the charity, um, sort of a uh, pilot's license doesn't even make the top ten list the top things I've gained from the it? Mm. Yeah. It's, you do get challenges though, and certainly I know that um, just speaking to a young chap who's one of our new flyers earlier on today and he was saying he's lost his left arm so physically lost his left arm he was saying that he wanted to learn to fly for a long time but he didn't know where to go because um, a lot of schools wouldn't know how to deal with someone with such a profound disability and I think that's the real cool thing about aerobility is that when they train you to fly it's, it's an established program yeah. frankly you're not the first person like that and, mm -hmm. and I'm not the first person like this and, mm -hmm. but it's just this this whole thing this whole shtick of knowing exactly how to bring you on how to lead you yeah, on yeah. how to train you but I think as part of that you get osmotically drawn into this family of well yeah it's a family it really is it's a community centre really, isn't yeah, it yeah and I think that's the number one thing mm -hmm. so how much have you changed since you first came here I think that, that's quite a tough question 
because I, I'm sort of, you can't really see that changing in like how you are with other people. Mm. But I would say within myself, I'm a lot happier. Yeah. I'm um, a lot more confident. Oh yes, I, I don't know where life would have gone if I didn't find out a bit of it. Because I, I sort of had, I, I didn't know where, what I wanted to do or anything like that. I mean, I would have found something, but mm. possibly not something I would sort of get the most out of. That's a really, really important point you've raised there, uh, because... I mean, when I had my accident, I lost my business, I lost my job, I lost the way of earning a crust. Um, and just through, when we came to the lockdown last year, to the first the first lockdown, obviously it was a challenging time for everybody with funding and our donors were having difficult times. And you think to yourself, well, what, what's going to happen now um, if something happens to our ability? And you don't realise how much, quite how much you are relying on that charity mm. for, not day to day, but for... It gives you a purpose, a strong yeah, purpose, yeah, yeah. you know. And it's it, right. It's not just about the flying. It's about the people and about and for me about the next generation. Yeah, you know? yeah. But this is giving you your job as well. You're saying. Yeah, true. It has. It, it's given me a lot. I know. Even I moved out of home this year, but that was with someone I met through our ministry, and I think I, I had to. Uh, circumstances not been as they were I would still be at home yeah. so, so it, it just I guess makes opportunities arise mm. um, but yeah it's sort of all, all the encompassing for, yeah, yeah. for me do you think though that sort of I mean as well as the, the positive feeling that we get from our from our friendships our relationships and the flying and all that, do you think that overcoming challenges and achieving things do you think that has a positive impact on it? And, and yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it does for me. What about you, Paul? Yeah, for me, it's it's all about. Um, I mean, the reason I'm here is because a because I love flying and I want I do want to get my license, but I kind of I almost just want to sort of tick it off and 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 be able to say that it's something I've achieved that requires you know it does require real dedication mm -hmm. commitment um a little bit of skill um and quite a lot of work to get there and i'm you you two have got your licenses i'm halfway through um hopefully getting mine but um it's just a kind of box i almost want to tick and say great i've i've managed to achieve that what i do with it afterwards i you know i definitely intend to keep it up but it's almost to sort of get over the line and say, okay, that's, I've, done that, that. I've done that, and that's something I can do, and I can and I can say I'll always be able to say that you know, well, hopefully, I'll always be able to say that I, I got my pilot's license. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you how it was going to be for you exactly, exactly how it was going to be for mm -hmm. you. Right, you got to get your license because you fly beautifully and you've got you've got the commitment to what you're doing. Right, it's great. You get the license, you get the end of it, and then you might not fly for a week or two weeks or whatever, but you won't re recognise it until after a couple of months. If you don't fly for a couple of weeks, you start getting a bit a bit cabin fever, a bit twitchy, yeah. you know, okay, and you, you almost need yeah. it. But the interesting thing you should say about the flying and all the things you're learning is when it comes to the challenges, I think we'd all agree that the not one of the challenges we faced were down to our disability. Now was that no. was that down to our training? Was it down to our attitude? I, 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 yeah, for me, it's challenging. Coming in on final, I've got a control column, I've got a throttle, I've got a trimmer, I've got a carpet and an RT, so I've got one arm doing all that. So yeah, it's a challenge, but that's training. Similarly for yourself, you you can't operate the rudder pedals without yeah. using the control column. Harvey, you, yeah, but what what challenges did we have really? For me, that wasn't it. It was oh, am I going to get lost? Am I going to stall on takeoff and kill myself? I, all, all these things. Yeah. Uh, isn't that right, though? It's, it's, yeah. It is. Like, the, the worries, I don't think, are too different from any other body. Um, so, yeah, for me, it was getting lost at emergencies. But it is what you said earlier. Once you put that throttle forward, they will 
go to the back of your mind. So how, how quickly did you get over your phobia? I mean, from my experience, like, uh, as soon as we left the runway, it was just yeah. sort of something clicked, and I was like, oh, I, I love this. So, I know genuinely said that just as we were climbing up. <laughs> and uh, and so, after that, went on to get my license. And uh, I think pushing me on, I, I never wanted to just give it a go. Um, I either wanted to get my pilot's license or not fly, fly at all. So yeah, I mean, anyone can fly. We're, yeah, we're yeah. very strong on that. You don't need a medical to fly. Yeah. So anybody, any disability can fly with their ability. The, the only thing is is that not everybody can get their licence because of usually because of, of, of medical issues. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm with you, so it took me four or five attempts to get my medical. And, yeah. and I really wasn't interested in just going up as a passenger. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's got to be got to be in control of your own destiny. Yeah. 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 So uh, how would getting your medical... Um, obviously, for me, um, I mean, my Amy's really, really good guy down in down Gatwick. But I remember going for the first one. I turned up sort of without an arm, without a leg, a big chunky chap, and I've gone down there knowing that I had a medical when I was 18. So, of course, when I'm 50 odd, it's going to be just as easy. It's going yeah. to be blind here. So, I was there for about an, an hour, hour and a half, and he gave me the full examination. And he said, well, Okay, well, we're going to have to do some more investigation in this because. Uh, I had a stroke, and obviously the obvious thing is that the elephant in the room was my lack of arm, mm -hmm. and he was totally not used to dealing with, with disabled pilots. Mm -hmm. And he could see that I was really quite crestfallen, right? And he turned around to me and said to me, you didn't honestly think that you were going to go out if you were with the medical today, if you used the tech? I said, well, actually, yeah, yeah I did. Um, and, that, and to be fair to him, though, um, it was a whole process. So once it was, the first time it was, no, sorry, uh, we have to do some more investigation. Let's go back. Went back. Then it was okay with a safety pilot. Then it was okay, no safety pilot, no passengers. And then it was after that, no safety pilot. So it was, it was really to get my full cleared, yeah. you know, uh, flying medical. It was, it was four, four yeah. trips. Um, but you know, a I get the fact that they, they're protecting themselves because they have to. They're pr protecting their professional integrity. But I think first of all. People are so gung ho to get up there, so dying to get up there, they'll, they'll they'll do and say anything to get that, you know, and and so he was right to make sure that he was checking me all along the way. So now every time I go back, it's a bit more of a, yeah. a bit more of a formality. How about yourself? Uh, my medical um, it, the, initially it took it took a while because of some of the drugs I'm on, um, and we had to change one of those. Um, before they were happy, yeah. but I got one of my drugs changed, and um, and then after that it was it was passed, and then I've been back for a so that took about you know, six weeks to sort that out, and then I went back for the second medical, and he sort of asked me a few questions, checked the normal things, and then printed me off a new medical form. And I was exactly like, that. I was like, oh. Well, that's okay. easy. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. this is easy, you know. Yeah. So yeah, so it was. Um, yeah, it took a while. I was a little bit concerned because um, we were struggling to find a drug that that uh, the CAA were happy with, um, but we sorted it out. Yeah, I had the same um, thing with medication yeah, as well. Exactly the same. I mean, there's. Uh, I don't know if you. Uh, Baclofen is one of the oh. tablets I take. An anti an anti um, spasmodic drug. Yeah, isn't it? yeah, and yeah. they and actually they were fine. Yeah, I think they were fine with that because I've taken it for so long. It was, yeah. it was you know, deep though, it's not, wouldn't have a, an effect on me. But if uh, I don't think I could come off that, and there is no alternative for that, no. I couldn't. I couldn't survive without taking that up because the times I've forgotten to take it, it's horrendous. But I get the feeling. So, that, that uh, I get the feeling that, that it's very much a, a pathway that you're on with the AMEs. Mm. It, it certainly was for me. You've shown you've done this and this and this and this for so long. But they're quite quite receptive. What about you, Harv? Is there any problems with your medical? Uh, there were. So I uh, used to, uh, oh, yeah, oh, I uh, had problems growing up with anxiety and depression, uh, which is obviously it doesn't go hand in hand with a command in an aircraft. No. Um, but the main thing was I was on a drug at the time, had been for years, because that 
Mutazapan. Um, okay, what's it? Well, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like an antidepressant. And um, it was all sort of okay. And I got a call from a pen from a real estate on the morning of uh, my medical. And uh, he, he asked about medication. And I, I told him. And uh, he went, oh. Did you know that's what the German wind pilot was taken oh, when wow. he uh, did, wow. did his accident a week ago? And yeah. uh, it could have been worse. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so, yeah, just had to t- talk about that. But the, the big benefit of flying is. Uh, between my medicals, the first one was sort of a no. Um, between medicals, I was able to come off all that medication and uh, and get my class to medical uh, about a year later. So, so that's been a real impact for me with flying. It allowed me to regulate my mood. Mm-hmm. Um, without the need for medication, which is it's, it's really the, good. It's bizarre, isn't it? How yeah, um, you know, I can be up there completely pain free when I'm flying. It just, it's it's a cathartic thing, isn't it? I, just it love is. it. I really love it. But um, we skipped over an important point when we began, which will be quite interesting. Go on. Um, what is the difference between me having a disability from birth and you acquiring it later on? Because I've always thought that you guys have it tougher because Interesting. you sort of know what you're missing. Sort of you know what you're missing, yeah. You've yeah, been yeah. able bodied. It's so a bit you, obvious there's a leg yeah, missing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> That was an intense <laughs> thing <laughs> But uh, for me, I've, I've always been disabled. I don't really know what it's like on the yeah, other well. side. And, and also, yeah. you were quite young, weren't you, when you were judging? Yeah, I was 17, and it's. I've, I always used to, I've thought about that as well, and I think, for me, actually, weirdly, I think I'm almost sort of glad it happened at 17. I, I, cause huh, interesting. I. I been able to incorporate it in my life. I went to university after that. Um, I started work part of that, and it's been part of me ever since. And I know when I was in hospital, and there were guys who were, you know, in their forties, married with kids, and then suddenly, bam, bam they break their back or they break their neck, um, and they're in a wheelchair, and they're in a marriage, and they've got young kids or something and going through a massive change in their life horrible I think that would be really really tough whereas me I just it just became part of my life I mean I do I do remember I remember what it was like before I I, you know I like I don't regret I try to have no regrets in life and I'm lucky that I have a fairly I've always had a fairly positive disposition I've always been fairly happy um Mm. I, I, um, which really, really helps. Um, Absolutely. There's, I mean, I used to be really sporty as a kid. I was good at pretty much all all sports, um, and that was suddenly taken away from me. And that that was, t- you know, I, you know, I wish I could have carried on playing football. Um, and I miss, I do, I do miss that. And I miss the challenge of not being able to compete with my, you know, all my mates from university. Um, not being able to compete with them on that level um, I find hard sometimes um, but I've just found other things I mean I I, used, I could juggle before my accident but just three balls but after when I was in hosp- hospital my um, <laughs> my physiotherapist when I was in hospital I said I told them I could juggle and by this point I was I was starting to stand up again and they said right well, well let's, let's find three juggling balls let's, let's do something like that get on with it and um, and then when I went when I left hospital, that was juggling was the one sport I could still do, and I could stand up, and I so I got really really good at juggling. There's three pens over there, Harvey. <laughs> <laughs> and um, for a long time, that was my that was one of my obsessions. 
I mean, I don't. I can still juggle, but I don't do it. I don't do it regularly anymore. And I'm. Oh, uh, was that right? Um, yeah. So, well, juggling balls, or you've got the flames, or chainsaws, balls, clubs, fire. I've got the fire clubs in the boot of my car still. I'm still juggling. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. Next year's ball, he's going to do a turn yeah, up on the yeah. stage for um, us. Yeah. <laughs> But it, yeah, it was. It's, it's been a big part. It's really been a big part of my life. Don't you said I mean, it's just really interesting. Uh, two two things you said really interesting. That you're glad that it happened earlier in your life. Well, not mm-hmm. glad, but it was unfortunate. I mean, it happened. I think it helps. I think it, it, it helps. I'm glad it, it helps you incorporate it into your life. It does because you. I saw when I was having my first fitness, the prosthetics. I was in the uh, what they call the knock near the John Radcliffe Nuffield uh, Orthopedic Centre. Yeah. And there were this was like a sort of the, the centre of the whole area for. Um, amputees and you of course amputees come in all shapes sizes and ages and I always remember seeing this kid in there who was a bilateral below knee amputee so yeah. two legs off below the knee yeah. and this little boy couldn't be more than seven and it was it was truly horrible to see a child that young with mm. prosthetic legs mm. but he was on a pair I think, I think they call them wheelies you know those trainers yeah, know, yeah. that have got the wheels uh, built into heelies. them like, heelies yeah. Yeah. and he's going come down this, the, <laughs> come down this flipping room clattering down the room, crash, taking all the chairs with him. But bang, up he got and got on with it. Yeah. And so, in a sense, it's horrible to lose your legs, but if you're going to have to have it, it's a good age to have it because you'll soon, soon mm. learn to live on yeah. And the other thing you said was about this, this positivity, this wave of, uh, you say, you're an optimistic person. Mm. Absolutely. Well, I'm always of that, it'll be better tomorrow. Yeah. And I think that, that does that does carry you. I always try to I focus on what I can do and yes, and I, I, I don't worry too much about what I can't do. It's quite... And sorry, go on. And there's, uh, there's plenty that I can do. And it's... It's, um, it's just... I don't see the point in, in focusing on what you can't do anymore. Absolutely. It's just a rabbit hole you're going to go down. And, and, and I'm... I don't want to, and there's plenty I can do that I I enjoy, and um, I've done loads of crazy stuff in my life um, over the years, and yeah, and actually, weirdly, it sent my life down a completely different route, and most of which I've really enjoyed. Yeah, uh, my life, the direction of my life changed that day, my accident, and it's I've taken a completely different route. I've no idea what the other one would have been. I've been like, might not have been as good. It's interesting um, because it's it certainly is a life defining moment, isn't it? Yeah, it shaped my career. I, at university, I got involved in student radio, which I wouldn't have done if I um, if I wasn't for my accident. I almost certainly would have just played sport. Would have been my thing at university, um, but because I couldn't do sport, um, apart from juggling, you call that sport. Yeah. Uh, it is a sport, by the way. Yeah. Okay. And, um, <laughs> Um, competitive juggling. Yeah, um, same as dancing and darts. Darts, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the same <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, but I got involved with the student radio station, and that's led on to my career, and that's what I've done for a job over the, you know, ever since. Bizarre, is how you make the, the best out of what you've got. Mm. Mm. I mean, I from my point of view, I know Liz asked us. This is have you met Liz one of the ladies we work with at, uh, in the office she's XRAF and um, she, she said this once both Harvey and myself so if you could turn back time and uh, lose the disability would you have your would you lose your disability but you lose the flying as well or would you keep your disability and, and, and keep the flying and Harvey's answer was of course he's he's never known any different and he, mm-hmm. he's happy as he is he's fired for me disabled at f- no, I'm not disabled. I, it might be semantics. How old were you when you had your bike? Forty six. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, just as a side note, I don't consider myself disabled. It's going to sound crazy, but you got to think positive. You got to think yeah. that I am a person with a disability. Now, the whole English speaking world would probably argue with me over that, and they would say that you got a blue badge, you're disabled. And to, yes, but I like to think that I've got a disability, and it's not going to step in the way, like you said, of what I want to do in life. The only thing. That completely confounds me. It's Kieran's. <laughs> oh, you know, and, and now I've oh, gone yeah. for carabiners. You know, just you try yes. doing a key ring with your eye, 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 one hand, and it doesn't work. There's so, two wobbly hands. It's hard. To <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. The two wobbly or one straight. Yeah. 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 That could be a would you rather question. Would you rather one arm or two? Two wobbly arms. hands. <laughs> <laughs> What are the hardest things for you, Harvey, the, 
what are, the, what are the things your disability stops you doing? Um, I guess it's really hard to say because you just learn to do things in your own way. So I would say now I do everything but with varying de- degrees of difficulty. Mm. So I would say shaving still stumps me a little bit. <laughs> I mean, I would say I feel it if it's uh, relevant. But um, the other week, I was going out to uh, meet a girl, and that uh, in the morning seems to be a common thread. <laughs> it does, yeah, absolutely. In, I'm a pilot. Yeah. <laughs> if only that. We, ne- we, we never found out what happened to the girl at college. Oh yeah, what happened friend. to the girl from college? The one you were oh, it was just between us. <laughs> I'm not going to tell yeah, anybody. Yeah, no, yeah, we broke up. Oh. Um, oh, yeah, okay. no, no, no. You need to get a bigger plane, that's what yeah. it is. Like, yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> But anyway, get, going out on a bit of a date, and uh, in the morning, thought, oh no, I better have a shave. So I have an electric bead trimmer, and uh, I picked it up and thought, this will be all right. So I trim it away, and I get halfway through it, and it runs out of battery. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so your patchy bits there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I had uh, all morning job deep deep bits and stage it. It took me about an hour and a half to have a shave. It's um, frustrating. I, I find it all <laughs> when you got little things to do like or not little things, but things that if you can't it may be difficult for you, I find it so frustrating. But you yeah, yeah. gotta calm down. Do you get do you get frustrated? Oh yeah, no. Like, Little things like doing screws and sort of DIY, that really frustrates yeah. me. But no heads out on the head, you got to calm down because the more frustrated you get, the, the more likely yeah, 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 you're yeah, yeah, not yeah. going to win. Um, but, but yeah. So it just, if I can just ask you, uh, I've, never, I've never got an answer for you for this question, but I know with cerebral palsy, you have a problem with hitting... Uh, fine spot. So if I wanted to touch that button there, I could I could do it very easily. Yeah. yeah? Now obviously with with a touch screen cockpit that we're working in at the moment, that's got to be quite challenging for you to find that specific spot. Yeah. So what are your coping strategies? I know one of our colleagues, Kev, who also suffers from cerebral palsy. Sorry, doesn't suffer from cerebral palsy. He lives with cerebral palsy. Um, he tunes in all his radio channels before he goes and just flip flops rather than trying to tune in one two one decimal or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. So what's your coping strategy house? Um so the good thing about radios and transformers is they stick out of the panel. So ninety percent of the time on the top they'll have a little ledge where I try to hook my hand over and then use my thumb or one of my fingers to dial in what I need to do. But the big thing about cerebral palsy is your brain works on like programs on like a computer, which can be really good, uh, but also really irritating. So one of the programs might be if you walk into the room, you turn on the light. Really helpful at night, really annoying during the day when you just automatically turn on the light. So the more you fly, the more you get used to where your hands are going. Um, but it, it's all about adapting and finding your coping mechanisms. I, I can say that, again, because of, I had a degree of ignorance about cerebral palsy mm. before I came to, to air ability, and I realized, I thought it was just sort of a, a physical manifestation uh, rather than you know affecting with a mental uh, issue as well. Yeah. Um, but I, again, going back to being judgmental, people say to us, "How do these guys manage to fly?" You know, and I thought along the same lines mm. and thought, "Well, how does how does Harvey make himself completely clearly understood on the radio to a controller that can't see him, doesn't know he's got a disability, mm. and, and and yet you hear his RT? Mm. It's bang on." Mm-hmm. But I think that's because it's so. It, it's yeah. so practice rehearsed, formulated. You you never know. So that's just brilliant. Huh? Yeah, I mean, I find doing that radio much easier to speak than than I do 
hear an open conversation, which is difficult to believe because I do spend most of my time talking. <laughs> but, yeah. but, but there you go. But so, so you're comfortable with your disability, I'd say, from, from birth. Yeah, I mean, it has its struggles. So I guess growing up with a disability, I guess the toughest bit is being young with a disability because children, can be cruel. In, they can be so cruel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess even when people are trying to include you, you still feel isolated. So. Where I went to primary school, I was their first ever disabled student. They were sort of learning about it as they went along, and I was learning how to be at school. Uh, I, but it was a little country school, only a hundred kids there, so everyone got to know me. Mm. But there, there are still times where people are horrible and they make mistakes and they I guess being in that environment with no other disabled person it can still feel quite isolated mm -hmm. um, it wasn't until I went to secondary school really where I regularly met other disabled people and that's where I began to accept it I've got to say I think society we're from a generation before you are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think that society has come a long, long way. I mean, my sister was born with a disability and, and she was literally shipped off to what was an old yeah, asylum, yeah. you know, yeah. where they had communal clothes and all this sort of thing. And so mm -hmm. thank God that society has, has, mm. has come that much further forward yeah, you know, yeah. these days. Yeah, and I am very grateful for that because I mean, my, my parents were quite old-fashioned um, and just like things that they did, some good, some not so good, but the one thing is they drilled it into me how I guess lucky I am to be born in the time where I was born and even in the lot, even in my lifetime I can see how far sort of the acceptance of disabled people had Progress. And yet, and yet, here's my one real big, huge peccadillo, is that um, this, the, the, the movement in terms of the world, the way the world is changing and moving is, mm. is wonderful in terms of diversity, in terms of acceptance, it's just fantastic. But I think as, uh, as a group, as a lobby, uh, we are still horrendously underrepresented on media, television, mm -hmm. really is a bit unfair because you, know, you, you can't you can't see what people on the radio, but no, I, no, it really. shocked me the other day that 20% um, of us in the UK live with a disability. Yeah. 20%, so that's the, uh, we are certainly underrepresented, but, and, and when it is, it does strike me as a little bit of tokenism, but certainly, I think you have a living evidence of, of, a, of a generation which is moving ahead, but, even though society is really accepting of, of, of disabilities, do you think they're ever going to be accepting of a pilot with cerebral palsy climbing into the 787 with his cap on and saying, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and flying the 787? Do we, do we think that that's going to happen? Do you think that's going to happen? Uh, well, I'll go first. I was actually talking about this yesterday evening. Um, because there are disabled pilots, yep. there's a guy from Florida uh, has an uh, arm missing, so he has a prosthetic limb there. The reason I know him, he was in the paper because it fell off during landing. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, it's not a great <laughs> advert, <is> it, huh? <laughs> but, but, but that's the thing over there. But we got him and we got um, a friend of a charity, uh, Mike Wallman, who's yeah. a captain for Virgin Atlantic. So I think for disabled people to work in commercial aviation, yes. Um, people with cerebral palsy, I don't think the world are ready for. Um, because I would say, and one thing I hate about my disability, the only thing, is how I speak. 
Yeah. And I think there's an awful lot in that. So I feel like when people hear me speak, they make a judgment about my mental capacity, my intelligence. Yeah. And I've had people where I've been sit at a party, no one would have known, and they've come over and started talking to me one way. And I've replied, and they've started treating me totally differently. Mm. So I, I think um, society has a long way to go um, before they fully accept uh, sort of captain my voice. Do you know However, got to. <laughs> if they're there, sort of at the gate, and I come on the tunnel, they haven't got much choice but to accept <laughs> that ever. What is your, give us, give us your best uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, um, who am I flying for? British Airways. <laughs> you fly yeah. the Concorde. Concorde. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard. Oh, Jesus, I'm getting off. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I reckon you should do next time you go on holiday, Harvey, right? So don't wear a pair of Bermuda shorts, a little, right? Mm. Dress as a captain with yeah. the bars, right? And yeah, just walk yeah. on and go, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good morning, and just, just look for the, just look to see what the reactions are. <laughs> well, I half did that coming back from an airability trip to Geneva. Um, I, um... Hold up a story, but I had gone with that Stuart and Wayne, two friends of the charity in wheelchair users, um, through the assistance sort of process, because I was told at Gatwick I needed it every time I go to an airport. So, yeah. And the lady was quite scary, so I wanted to come back with assistance so I didn't get told off. Um, but we we came up to the side of the aircraft in the truck and you pulled the opposite direction to everyone else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I walked on and said, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I'm your captain. <laughs> <laughs> no one person asked like that, apart from my Karen, who <laughs> sort of gave me a little smile on the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Love it. Uh, I think you're right, though. I think there's degrees of disability as yeah. well out there. And I think that you know, even if the society gets to a point where they'd accept a person with cerebral palsy, for example, um, it'll probably be all automated by then. I think we, I don't think we, uh, have, yeah, yeah. we won't have pilots. That's a sad thing. I mean, I am not looking forward to the future of aviation. You tell me you, you wouldn't fly in a, a pilotless aircraft. I mean, no. Ooh, control freaks. <laughs> so I, I would, but it takes away why I want to fly. It's about sort of being at the control yeah, sort that's, that's of dodging weather. That's never going to go away. There'll always be little planes. To Absolutely. Fly. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope so. And I hope people don't find it pointless. So where do you want to go with your flying? You, what's your goal now? Uh, I would love to be an instructor. Great. Yeah. Mm. How about you? Um... I mean, I've still to get my license is the first goal, and then, yeah. and then see where it goes after that. I mean, I, I would love to be an instructor as well. So I, I, I really enjoy part of my job. A, a lot, a big part of my job is teaching and training, which I, I enjoy. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I'm away off that. I mean, my first goal is to get my license, and then, and then see where we go. And then find a new goal. It's funny, isn't it? How um, I mean, for me, it's about the arrows. It's about formation. It's about I mean, yeah. night flying. Well, I frankly, yeah, okay, we take or leave that. Night yeah. flying, but um, but the one at the top of the tree is, and the reason why I got a bulldog was to take people up and mm. say, look, guys, look, you can do this, and you know, do do some instructing as well. Just I mean, from the people that that, that I've taken up for a flight, able-bodied and disabled, like like you and I went down to the solar, didn't you? Yeah. Right? Man, you got a buzzer but I got such a buzzer I still remember yeah. he corrected me for not putting the correct spork in on the uh, on the transponder. It's unacceptable. <laughs> I have never done that. No, <laughs> in fact, I did that this morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's about it's about putting back in, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it's just if you haven't had your accident 
you wouldn't be flying now, would you? Do you and do you think you never would have taken it up again? Probably not. Right into it? So I was. Were was you before your accident? Did you want to fly again? Um, good question. So um, no, I, I think in, in a physical sense as well. I was too big. I was. Um, I won't say that the accident was a good thing to happen to my life because it certainly wasn't. And you know, if I could go back to being able-bodied and not fly again, I would, mm -hmm. because of all that comes with my particular disability. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean to say I wouldn't be involved in aerobility, of course, because that's yeah. we've all said it's what we love being here. Um, but you know, it, it's a it's it's a bit of a hollow question to be asked here about the disability would I give it up because you know when you wake up at three o'clock in the morning in pain it's, mm. it's an obvious question mm -hmm. but yeah it's it certainly has done something in terms of the accident took me down a different path like mm. you said mm. and I'm very very grateful for the path that I've gone down mm. because it could have so been easy so much easier that I would have been dead it's as simple as that and you see the wonderful thing about being in aerobility is you do see people with lots and lots of different disabilities mm. and you see some people you think oh blimey that oh god that could be me you know, it's, you know. Mm. so yeah i i'm grateful for the opportunity it's given and i know i want to put back into it it's as simple as that really i'll tell you one thing that aerobility is and this is a slightly bizarre confession but um after i left I was actually in hospital. I, when I was in hospital, I was around a lot of other people with the same all sp uh, sp spinal units, so a lot of people with spinal injuries. I made, you know, I made good friends. And then I left hospital. And I went to university, and everybody I associated with was able-bodied. And like you, I never consider myself disabled. I still struggle to say I am disabled. I would rather say I have a disability, or I I'll say I walk on crutches, or um, and I then got really uncomfortable if I was in a situation where I was in a situation because around other disabled people purely because I have a disability to the point where I actually didn't like being around other people with disabilities I would avoid it and, and that's why I've never done disabled sports I think it's one of the reasons I've never done disabled sports Interesting. because I just avoided being around disabled people because it's not how I wanted to identify myself yeah. And um, and it's funny, in coming here has sort of broken down that barrier a bit for me. Is it because there's a degree of, I say degree of, because only because there's a camera focusing at me, but is there a degree of irreverence? That, that, oh, you, you know, is, someone would say, this, and we have used this line before, it's, this isn't disabled top trumps, you know. You know so so <laughs> is, is that openness, that, that irreverence, that, does that make a difference, do you think? A little bit, you know. It's, Tough not being the most disabled person in the room. <laughs> 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 it always makes me laugh when people say to me, oh, well, that's bad. I had a bad bike accident once. You go, well, really, did you? <laughs> Honestly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you just, I'm looking to get the most sympathy in the room. And I'm, yeah, not yeah. Really, oh, I'm not going to get the most sympathy anymore. But, and there's a very serious point you just raised there, quite, I think, quite, quite subtly, in that, I don't know about you, but having come into disability has made me a lot more tolerant and a lot less tolerant so it's maybe a lot tolerant of people a lot more tolerant of people that have got disabilities that might not be at, at the top of the strength and capability tree but it's also maybe a lot less tolerant of what i would think would be blaggers you know mm -hmm. and I, I also know as well that um disabled people people with disabilities are humans just like everybody else and the one thing that really irritates me is someone that would use their disability as a lever to try and get something better for them yeah. because a better go. and I can't really can't abide that it's just no. I hate jump uh, I hate jumping cues purely because of my disability I have a real issue absolutely. with it absolutely you know in and I was, I was well I was at an event last night and uh, I was happy to you know sit at the back of it I, I've got I've got, got a wheelchair this year which is the first first time I've had a wheelchair in 30 years and I've because I've put that off for I've always put that off and never wanted to give in and get a wheelchair and actually now I've got it, I, I love it. And it's like yeah. opened up a whole new avenue to my life. Anyway, I happened to be using it last night. And uh, I was very happy to sit my place in the queue yeah. and wait. Yeah. My other half, my lovely other half. She, wonderful, she, lovely other half. Yeah, this is why I see this, yeah. Uh, she was, um, 
adamant that we were going to just go and have a little word with the man in charge and see we, is there another way we need to go in and of course there was another way we need to go in and it was <laughs> via the front of the queue uh, and yeah. you know so that it's it's interesting that I don't like to not abuse my position but I don't like to stick out as different no, 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 I don't like to I don't like it being highlighted that I'm different absolutely you know you're special come this come this way you know you're you're coming in this way but um, in in Portugal and Madeira, it's it, they've got strange rules over there about disabilities. And I mean, when I say strange, I mean good laws and rules. So one of the laws over there is is that if you're in a queue in Tesco's or wherever, um, then the person with a disability has automatic priority to go to the front of that queue mm -hmm. uh, to pay for your groceries. Yeah. Right? And and for me, okay, standing on this leg for a long time and holding shopping, yeah, it can be it can be kind of difficult, but then. But I remember the first time I was over there, everyone was trying to usher me forward to this mm -hmm. queue. And you know how Brits are the best at queuing, yeah. obviously, in the world, you know. I was, couldn't help but think, I'm jumping the queue. I can't jump the queue. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I, I'm British. I queue properly. But yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. You, it, it's, it's not patronising. It's meant to help you. It's meant to support you. But it can feel like that sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Interestingly, I... I don't get caught up with the semantics of disability. I, I do consider myself a disabled person. Like, because when I was growing up, that's just how it was. Um, but I feel like people can take that a bit too far nowadays. In what sense? Like, I did, so before here, I used to work at m and and uh, people just sort of used to avoid conversations and sort of... The worst thing is when sort of kids would point it out and their parents would yeah, yeah, sort yeah, yeah, of yeah, yeah. go, no, no, no. But, I mean, if, if they point it out at young people and we can have that chat, then that sort of trains the... Uh, I, then growing up, okay. I love kids because yeah, yeah. when I get in the pool to go swimming, you can see it. So of course I rip the leg off and I yeah. jump in a very sort of unelegant sort of way, and you can see these kids looking at me, and you know they go out and they put their goggles on and they go underwater like that and they're looking at me <laughs> like that. Right? They don't think that you can see them looking at you and the temptation to shout shark, shark, shark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Your point is well made. It, it, we don't like feeling different. We don't want any special yeah. treatment. We like consideration. I've become very, very um, bolshy about uh, disabled parking spaces. Mm. Not because of me, but because of the, the arrogance of the person that will park the car and think that mm. the rules don't apply to them. So yeah. that really, that really irritates me. And, and I, I don't. I, I've never liked inconsiderate people, able-bodied or otherwise. But certainly to see the way that some disabled people are treated, you know. Yeah. yeah. So let's put a positive spin on this. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's, so that's sounding doom and gloom now. Best moment of airability. What's your best moment, Hobbs? Oh, close, very close. I've got to say, man. I mean, mine was my first solo flight was one of the best moments of my life. I mean, it was, yeah. it was utterly surreal, um, bizarre couldn't believe that I've been allowed to go off on my own. I think you're exactly so you couldn't believe that someone would let you yeah. go off on your own and fly on plane. Yeah. Someone would actually let me go and do that. Um, and it was almost like an out-of-body experience. Mm -hmm. I did one circuit of the airfield, lasted about eight minutes, yeah. and it was just surreal from start to finish. I mean, it really felt like I was observing myself doing it um and i absolutely loved it it's, it's been one of my goals my whole life to fly a plane and that was the first time i mean when you go up with the instructor most flights you do do all, all of the flying but the instructor is always sat Super there next to you yeah, so it yeah. never feels like you know you everything is on you but when you go up on your own it's it's, you're the only person who's yeah, in charge of that plane and responsible yeah. for that plane um, and it was yeah it's what I've always wanted to do and it was incredibly satisfying to finally achieve it so what I think you'll find is that uh, with the solo you're absolutely right 
you know, I, I had two first solos, mm. one when I was 17 and a half and one when I was 50 odd years of age. Yeah. And it's, it's great in that it goes just like that. And it's, it's, a, it's a real sort of a seminal moment in your life. But I think you'll enjoy your qualifying cross country mm. even mm. more. I did, I've done a couple of cross countries on my own now. And um, again, the first time mean, I did so many, so I did circuits for about eight hours. So when I finally got to do a cross country solo, um, I was nervous leaving sight of the airfield. Yeah, and, of course. And what if? Um, yeah, and I sort of, but then when I, so I settled into it, and I, I did. It was and it was nice to actually go somewhere and um, and come back and so, find your way back. But when you do your QXC, mm. you're landing away mm. at two separate airfields. Mm. And when I did mine, yeah. I got so I did here to Lid, Lid, Leon Solent, Leon Solent back yeah. here. And when I got to Leon Solent, which is a, as you know, it's my one of my favourite airfields. Yeah. Told them I was doing my QXC, and they gave me a stuffed seagull as a memory, and that's still sitting in the kitchen now. That stuffed seagull. Yeah. I, I was it, for, right from the beginning when I first started learning, the um, the solo cross country was this thing which I sort of I thought, okay, I'm not. Oh, if I'm looking forward to that. That sounds really scary. But now I've got to the stage that I'm at, I'm actually looking forward to it. It's another step. Yeah, I'm, another I'm, step. I'm, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm ready for it. I'm, well, I'm not ready for it yet, but I'm, I am looking forward to it. I'm not, and I'm not worried about it. No, no. Um, it's a train that does that, isn't it? Yeah, I'm not, it doesn't, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm really hoping to get through the rest of my training as quickly as I can. To get um, that license. get it done. And, um, my, you know, my goal is to, Take take friends, take family, um, and and fly somewhere for lunch. Yeah, the hundred dollar burger. Yeah, and fly home again. Yeah, and absolutely. um, just you know, like you said, the experience of taking people with you and and being you know the person in charge. Yeah, yeah. And it gives you a, a sense of achievement. It gives you uh, responsibility. And it gives you. It's yes. empowerment, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah. and it you know it really makes you realise what you can do and get up to in life. And um, yeah, um, it's. What about you, Hans? What's your what's your moment? I uh, I have to say it's not flying related. Okay, so, so judge it by your earlier performance. You're talking about either girls or no, no. Again, yeah. you, this is slanderous. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it has to be sort of when when we go away as a group, yeah, and we we just sat there having dinner, maybe in France or Geneva, and it's just sort of a group of friends that growing up, or I never thought that would be possible for me to have. So it's. Really nice, just uh, have some food, have some beer, and uh, have a laugh together. And of course, we're, we're into that, is that flying to and from. But, but, today, with, with those meals, it's just time to sit back and think, yeah, well, I've, I've done a good thing here. Yeah. What was your first solo like? First solo, um, there was a lot going on. It's um so it took off and we were like well, I was parallel with a helicopter, so that freaked me out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um but the whole experience just goes in a flash. I seem to remember I did a greet on the landing. Oh you do have me now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It does happen. What do you like to you? I would love to say I'm not showing off. Do you know what I like to say when yeah, I'm landing? Yeah. I mean if you've got someone sitting next to me who's never flown before, I like to say to them, as I'm coming I still haven't got the hang of this, you know, and in very <laughs> they'll do yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So and for me, um it, I think you know, what you're saying is you're right, Harvey. I mean you've been your what but 10 months a year now, no more, two, 18 months, two, two years, years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so I, I've been here since September 2018, so it's three years, 
Um, and okay, but in that time you've had COVID, which mm. knocked us uh, completely yeah. Um So for me, I, I, I get what you're saying because there's so many events that I think, oh, that's just in your mind. Yeah. And obviously for me, the, the first solo for me here was, was awesome. But maybe not for the reason that you might think because this cunning, dastardly beast, I won't, I won't use a, 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 a profan- profanity there, um, played a practical joke on me when I got back. So when I got back from my uh, from my solo flight, I'm on the ground. You see, I'll show you some photos later. So he reached out to shake my hand, which oh, is very yeah. clever, <laughs> actually very clever. So I gave him my only working hand to shake, yeah, mm-hmm. which he grabbed and held, yeah. knowing then that I had have no defence whatsoever. And in his other hand, he had a bottle of water, which went <laughs> right over my head. <laughs> So that's a big moment for me, uh, and, and and you know also doing arrows with Mike in yeah. in Deezer, the former Aerobility Bulldog as well. Yeah. That was just, you know, the years melted off me doing that in that yeah. in that plane. So, yeah, those those are high moments for me. Yeah, arrows and and stupidity. It's what it's what we're all about. Right. Really. I mean, <laughs> that that's having to you, especially the stupidity bit. Yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> I wasn't going to mention that. <laughs> God. So I mean, we've been talking for about an hour now about mm-hmm. about our stuff, about, about aerobility, and, and what we love about it a lot. Where where do you think the, f- the future is for the charity? How do you think that we could improve it to make it better for other service users, other other people that join us? What do you think, Hobbs? Um, I I think what we do already is amazing, and uh, where a world leader in yeah, yeah, in right. terms of a charity which offers the advocacy and the each program scrum based stuff as well as the flying. And uh, so we can be proud of that and I think from here on in it's about the finding needs. Um and the the next sort of ten, twenty years I would love to see being about expansion. So we're taking in even more uh, people, spreading the word that, that bit further. Because um, currently, we, uh, if we do for people in Scotland, they have to travel, it, it would be good just to share that love far and wide. Um, where do you think the uh, project is going? Absolutely, so, so yeah, indeed. So from, from, from my point of view, sort of putting the trustee hands on, I think there's as well as the service users have on, that the project able with the grobs spreading the love out to a wider uh, ge- geography would be is a great thing for us mm-hmm. because half of the problem that we get we're in Taken Hill, we're in Blackbush mm-hmm. um, and we get a lot of people bringing us up, they're in Scotland, they're in Wales, they're in whatever, yeah. it's just, just too far so so that's the great thing we can do. But I also think that, just my own personal feeling, how many people looked at you when you got in your car this morning to drive here and said, oh look, is a disabled person driving a car. Not many. Why? Mm-hmm. Nobody cares. Yeah. Uh, because it's an accepted norm. Right, I'll rewind again, go back 40 years, and you'll see that a disabled person wouldn't be driving. And if they did drive, do you remember those green, horrible three-wheelers that disabled wagons used to see on the roads? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Horrible, dangerous. They said they drove one of those. Um, and so disabled drivers just, just didn't happen. Now, it's accepted as the norm. And isn't that something worth aiming for with aviation as well yeah. whether it's you know it, it, it might I agree I, I don't think it's going to be people ready for a 787 and by the time that comes it'll, it'll be automated but there's no reason at all that people should be looking at us and going oh wow look at that look what they can do you know we need to create that new norm so that's that's what I really, really feel passionate about acceptance yeah for you Clive I, I personally don't think there's I don't think there is that attitude out there I've, I've certainly not encountered it but people know what know that I'm doing this um, you know a lot every friend I've asked well the ones except for the ones who are just scared of flying they're all they're all willing to come flying with me if I if I give them a chance or if they've got a chance yeah absolutely and I I, I don't think there is um, a prejudice towards disability. I don't find it with driving my car. Um, uh, I think flying, because flying is a much more niche um, 
transport. Um, I don't think there's that wide sort of criticism or um, fear of disabled people flying. I, th- I mean, I think, I think with aerobility and its um, future, I just think the charity needs to make sure that everybody who qualifies to come here and take use of the charity that it, the name is out there as wide as possible yeah, yeah, yeah. so that everyone who has the chance at least knows about, knows it. about it I mean it, it's my own I, I mean it's amazing I don't know how I didn't come across it 20 years ago I because seeing as I've always had an interest in aviation I didn't hear the first time I knew of the name Aerability is when I googled disabled British disabled flying <laughs> club or something exactly and this was about two years ago and then one cropped up in I think it was in Somerset I think there was somewhere in Somerset that was offering um, disabled flying mm. and aerobility and so I and um, I thought oh, I'm going to have to go to Somerset to you know learn to fly and start googling how long that was going to take yep. and then I found aerobility and where they were and I thought oh that's a lot easier and I think if I'd known of the name ten years ago I would have been here 10, ten years ago. Well, I think to be fair, um, so we've we, we've only been going twenty seven years, mm. 27, 28 years, twenty eight, twenty eight, twenty eight years, and I know that, yeah. Well, you know the, the wonderful tour de force that is Mike Miller Smith. Mm. Um, I think he's been. I'm sure you'll correct me on this, but I think he's been with Air Ability so sort of twelve years, something like that, and and I think it went from being sort of quite a low key operation in Lasham to what it is today because of. Well, because of Mike and, and, and Shona and the people that have been here from, from day one. But you're absolutely right. You know, I, I've been a propeller head all my life mm. and I'd never heard of their ability. And it, it was on the Google, the Google search whilst I was in the hospital that provided me. And the reason probably why you wouldn't have heard of it 25 years ago is because we didn't have the internet, did we? You know, yeah. You know, that's yeah. The, the ability of Google just, just, just wasn't there. Mm-hmm. It here has a spare hole for now. Well, yeah. half a day. Half a, do you know, I, used to, I don't know if I told you, but I used to live in Kazakhstan. Yeah. Right? And um, this was in the dial up days. And I was staying living with my then girlfriend, now wife. And my boss, who was in America, would send me a file over on the computer to my laptop. And you know, you'd plug it in, and all this silly noise. And I was collecting, I was, con- I was connecting at, I think it was 12 and a half K. 12 and a half K. So I'd plug this in, you know, and off you'd go for dinner. With, the, with my girlfriend at the time, and come back, and you come back, it was still halfway through, two hours later, mm-hmm. and then it would crash, so you'd have to start the whole thing. I don't think we realise how much of a change yeah. it's had. Well, look at us, I, I certainly wouldn't be in this room now were it not for, for for the internet. And there's probably a lesson for us there as well, isn't there, in terms of you know the, 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 the promotion of, of, of the charity. Yeah, so I mean, I would, I don't know, I think we would target every sort of disability association, target, where where disabled people congregate in different clubs, just make sure that the name name is out there. Then, so you know there are going to be people with a disability and an interest in flying. I mean, I met I met a guy here on Tuesday um, who'd come for his second lesson, um, and he was very friendly, very enthusiastic. We got chatting. He was asking me all about what I've been doing, and um, he loved my sort of story and he's here he's had polio he was here with his wife um was telling me enthusiastically about his first lesson and um and i asked him how how he heard about it and he'd seen it on um tv the airability on was it southern today or south mm, today yeah, yeah, yeah. So he'd seen it on that and thought oh i've always wanted to fly and yeah, called absolutely. up absolutely he's 75. wow and he's just having his second lesson wow and he mm. Yeah, and so, and he saw it on South Today, and so there's someone who's who's had a lifelong interest in aviation, and um, sees their ability on TV, and and uh, next thing he's he's it's wonderful driving an hour and a half to get here for a for an hour lesson. It's it's wonderful to see that the changes that we make in people's lives. It's also for me it's just lovely to be with you guys. I love you loads of pair you. And it's just a shared, shared passion, and it's just, just wonderful. I think that we've probably bored everyone to death by now, haven't we? You know, probably. Probably. So, if anybody's left out there awake, yeah, um, 
just wanted to say thanks for joining us, Clive, Thank you. Harvey, myself, Neil. Um, and to, to Clive's point about getting the message out, guys and girls, <laughs> this, this may not be for you. Airability might not be for you directly, but I'm sure that it will be for somebody that you do know. Uh, please get the message out there. Send them to our website, www.airability.com. Um, come on down to Black Christian and see us. And, and if you can, the charity does rely on donations. Drop a few quid in the uh, in the collection tin. That would be absolutely wonderful. But do get the name out there. It's important for us that other people join us and we can continue doing the work that we do. So great to chat with you guys. You really great, cool, really cool. And thanks for setting me up, Harv. I've enjoyed. I really have enjoyed this. Yeah. Very good. Cheers. See ya.